of all the computer sectors. Okay, so that doesn't mean, and those of you that are in, in resource recycling, that doesn't mean that recycling doesn't have a role to play. It's just that for the average business, your materials that are being recycled often come at a cost. You have to pay for recycling or you get a just a very small uh, return on whatever you recycle. And the reason being is that the entire recycling process has all of these embedded costs in them. You know, you've got to pick up the materials, bring them to a plant, have the plant, um, you know, uh, break down the materials, send them off to other processors who can refine the materials, who can then put them back into the economic supply chain. And so that's why recycling is comparatively a costly endeavor. And we try to avoid that in the circular economy. However, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a role because eventually equipment wears out. You can't reuse and repair it forever. You can't remanufacture it forever. So we have to have a system where we can cost effectively recycle the equipment as well. And that folks is the circular economy in a nutshell. So if we were to see this from a macroeconomic perspective and what we're trying to you know, facilitate in Hume, the system basically looks like this. We've got a system where we're trying to keep out virgin resources from our system by creating an internal supply chain that allows us to keep the profits in Australia Point number one. And point number two, that gives Australian businesses some sense of insulation from resource cost inflation that happens when geopolitics get in the way and cause you know, markets to go absolutely insane, as we are seeing um, recently. So when you've got this closed loop system, it's not just about closing the loop, it's about seeking a way to optimize what you are doing within the system. And that's why our pyramids come back into play here. Both producers and consumers in the circular economy need to be given incentives, given the knowledge and given the ability to pursue these upper level tasks in terms of encouraging enhanced resource optimization. Because if we can encourage that, if we can generate a system that allows this, what we've done is we've generated a system where companies are able to maximize their profits, where consumers are able to minimize their costs. So we've got a far more efficient economy going for ourselves. And that's why Hume is investing in the circular economy. Okay, so very briefly, um, what do we talk about in the program? Well, the focus of the Circular Advantage program really looks at two elements. Number one is cost efficiency improvements, and number two is revenue efficiency improvements. They're both designed to try to achieve the same thing, which is to make better use of your resources. So we have a series of activities that we look at to explore how you can identify um, you know, cost efficiency savings through different types of initiatives. We also have a ses uh, session on design thinking, where we look at how you can apply design thinking to create new products and new services to improve your revenue efficiency. So really it's two sides of the same coin. We're still trying to encourage revenue efficiency, but one way you can do it is by reducing your costs. So notice how we increase improve the efficiency by reducing costs here. And another way you can do it is by improving your revenues. So uh, when I came to KPMG about three years ago, I brought all of my research with me and uh, designed this uh, corporate training program. And the corporate training program essentially has three components uh, to the Kaizen part and then three components to the design thinking part. So on the left here, you can see the Kaizen elements. We look at resource analysis. So how can you better make use of your resources? We look at your processes. How can you make better use and improve your processes? And finally, we look at the behavioral elements of cost savings. So how can we encourage um, you know, people within your organizations to be uh, working more effectively? 
Finally, on the right hand side, um, we've got components where we focus on, you know, the design thinking. So we're trying to develop an organizational ethos where people uh, are automatically thinking about how they can improve products for improved resource efficiency. And I've got a number of lenses that, um, you know, I, I employ to help companies to think through these strategies. And that's indeed, folks, what we're trying to achieve with this. Um, you know, this box says it all. Everybody thinks that they are running organizations that are the most efficient on the planet. After all, if you didn't think your organization was efficient, then the question is, why aren't you doing anything about it? So almost everybody that I, that I go in to consult with uh, has the idea that, you know, they're there's very little gain to be had in improving how um, the company uses resources. Uh, and then what I do is I go about the process of working with companies. I, I'm not the genius. The people that are the intelligent ones are in the, in the companies that understand the context within which you run your operations. All I do is I facilitate the thought process by introducing a number of different cognitive lenses, a number of different ways of thinking that will force you outside of your regular business consciousness and it'll force you to identify new ideas and new innovations that you probably had never thought of before. I'll give you six examples of the categories that are, are the modules that we include in our workshop. The first one looks at resource Kaizen. So here's a great example. Here's, this is a company um, and these photos I took in, in, uh, in Denmark, you can see I, I took them about eight years ago now. Giproc is actually a, a French company, but it's got a, a subsidiary in, in Denmark. And Giproc makes wallboards. Uh, so it makes the gypsum wall boards that, you know, we, we can purchase down at Bunnings. Now, if you look at gypsum, it's actually made from a material that's a calcite material that is uh, serendipitously also created artificially through coal-fired power plants. Now, this particular factory was mining gypsum in France and carting it all the way to Denmark in order to make their wall boards. So you can imagine how high the cost was for this material. Unbeknownst to them until they started to think about the circular economy, just down the road, there was a Dong cold fire energy plant. And this plant was, um, you know, was in the process of creating this artificial gypsum and then paying to get rid of it. So the two companies managed uh, through negotiation to come up with a contractual price that made this off sale for the coal fired power plant, a valuable commodity so they could get a little bit of money back for their waste instead of paying for it. Meanwhile, Giprock wound up with this, you know, the similar uh, material at a, a, a fraction of the costs. So we look at how we can explore better resource use in the program. The second thing is looking at process Kaizen. And, and I guess the best example was um, a, uh, a, a pro project that um, I was involved in, I guess, oh, maybe 15 years ago now. Um, a bunch of us at the National University of Singapore set up a, um, a, a social venture called Advanced Clean Energy Solutions. We called it that so that we can call ourselves ACEs. Advanced Clean Energy Solutions. Okay, too early for that. Anyway, my partner went to uh, consult on a uh, on a haberdashery in in uh, in Jakarta. Now, these meat processing plants, um, as you can appreciate, um, are are not exactly tourist fair. Um, you know, and just to summarize what happens there, you've got, you know, basically these cows, they go into a large building in the building, something really bad happens to them. And then out come these succulent beef steaks. Well, in the process, you also get this white goo pictured in the bottom frame here. That goo is, of course, tallow. And uh, tallow in agrarian societies has historically been used for making candles 
it's cow fat, right? Why? Because where there's fat, there's oil. And where there's oil, there's fuel. And so we actually took um, some of this back to the University of Singapore and digested it to get a sense for how much energy we could be producing. And we discovered that um, th this particular plant um, could digest all of this into biofuel and net themselves a million dollar saving in electricity costs over the year. So the question is, well, you know, this is a process. Um, why didn't they do this earlier? And the answer is because they didn't know about how to do this because it was beyond their scope of regular business consciousness. So that's what I mean by thinking outside of the box. And we have a number of frameworks that we offer to help to encourage you to think through your processes. Finally, behaviors. Well, um, my, my, my good friend, uh, Alan Pierce, who some of you may know, he's a bit of a, an energy guru in, in Melbourne, uh, took this um, uh, covertly in, uh, in, in Coles one, one, one night. And I took the picture into Coles and I said, uh, you know, here, I've uh, taken this picture. Um, in Japan, you typically give a, a, a present to somebody that you're visiting. This is my present, it's worth $5 million, you're welcome. And they said, what? And I said, look, we time this guy. And you know, we've all seen this picture, right? Before in, in real life, what's happening there is this young lad, he's got a hose full of warm water. He's spraying the water onto the ice that's in the seafood section upon which you know, most of the fish were presented. And I said, look, we time this guy, added in the uh, amount of uh, heat necessary to heat the water, added in the cost of creating the ice, and you know we've multiplied that by 365 days, multiplied that by 810 shops, and you've got yourself a $5 million problem. And what's really funny about this is that guaranteed in one of these shops, you've got a floor supervisor who eventually run by this young guy and tap him on the shoulder and say, good job, Joe. That's what I mean by beyond the scope of regular business consciousness. It's really all about encouraging people in your organization to view what they're doing with a different lens. Okay, let's switch quickly to design thinking. So in design thinking, and we've got three modules on this, we explore existing product improvements, we explore new products, and we explore how you can utilize uh, resources in the community. Great example is this organization, Dance Quilton, which is uh, another organization that uh, I was researching in Denmark. Uh, Dance Quilton makes beautiful wool carpets on old 150 year old looms. And these carpets are uh, generally speaking sold to cruise lines, uh, airlines. These are their two key markets. Now, I said to them when we were um, looking at um, how to make better use of, of products, I said, you know, so you've got these two organizations. How do they feel about, um, you know, the fact that you're, you're charging three times as much for the products that you than you should? And they said, what? And I said, well, if you think about how these carpets are actually used, um, you know, you put these down the hallway in a, uh, in a cruise line or an airline. What happens? Well, everybody walks down the middle, and of course the sides wind up still in pristine condition, while the center, you know, um, uh, uh, winds up with a with a lot of wear and tear. So, you know, eventually you either have to throw out the entire carpet because you're creating carpets on looms, or you know you have to make the decision of you know sort of cutting out patches, which will look awful. Either way, it's a uh, you know it's a, a tenuous. Uh, business proposition for, uh, for, for, you know, for cruise lines and for your customers. So, you know, what Dan Squilton has been doing over the last few years is um, looking for ways to create modularized carpet that still has the same quality, but is capable of actually just lifting and replacing, um, which is not easy to do because you've got to have a design for disassembly approach and the glues and stuff represent a, a huge problem. Nevertheless, it can be done. And we show you know, how you can approach the process of thinking through your current products and thinking through your current strategies so that you can understand where your weaknesses might lie. Okay, 
uh, design thinking new products. Well, this is a great example. Um, here's a company uh, also in Randers in uh, Denmark that uh, creates a CAFT machine. And the CAFT machine is basically like a mix master for industrial use. So the idea is, is that you've got a, a large, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, calved area, large uh, uh, area with some blades in it. And you put in any organics plus a binding agent and uh, it can create, you know, this type of material that you are seeing on the right here. And depending on how you adjust the tensile strengths of the rollers, you can either make thicker or thinner uh, materials. And if it's thinner materials, it's of course more rigid, which you see on the right here. So you can actually create wall boards and stuff out of these. Now I've seen this machine, this machine can, this, per, this particular photo in the center is uh, used newspaper plus the binding agent, Bico. Uh, on the right, um, you can see a white panel. That white panel is made out of used cotton. So here is a, here is a a company that was uh, trying to sell its machinery for a million euro and was having a hard time finding a market for it, despite the fact that this is a great idea. So through the circular economy and circular thinking, all about networks and collaborations, uh, they came upon a new model. And the new model was to create cooperative investments of like-minded firms that can make use of this equipment. So now you've got companies that have invested in a factory that use this equipment. The companies can earn additional income through the batch jobs, through outside uh, users, but it also can make use of the machinery for its own equipment. Again, thinking outside the box in terms of how to make better use of your resources. Okay, finally, um, Closer to home. This is a great example of uh, how a company has made use of local resources in order to bolster their product offering. So everyone knows about Downer and their works in the construction industry, in particular in laying asphalt roads. What many of you might not know is is one of our one of our local favorite companies in in Hume, uh, Close the Loop, uh, has contracted with Downer to create this product called Reconofelt. And basically, the, the product itself takes uh, a ser takes in all of the used toner cartridges from Close the Loop, as well as a number of plastic bags uh, collected through the Red Cycle program, and combines them with the regular materials to create asphalt. So they've dipped into this free resource and they've put it into the roads. Now, why would they do that? Well, according to research, Reconofault actually adds 30% to the durability of roads. So by putting these types of plastics into the roads, after having done due diligence regarding microplastics and the like, they have created a better product. So there's a great example of tapping into local resources. And, um, you know, if you're contacting, uh, you know, uh, Ian Davies, he will, he will most certainly be able to connect you with other businesses in Hume that are doing the same thing. Okay, very quickly, because I know I've got about four minutes before uh, the big shepherd's hook comes and drags me off stage. So what we've done is we've created a workshop series. Um, we've tried to keep it understanding that you're all busy as parsimonious as possible. Last year, we had a five month long online program that was a grueling endeavor. It was, you know, it was a long program for everybody. Uh, and we found that, you know, basically there's a lot of companies that just can't afford the time. And, you know, frankly, we've decided on a new model of delivery uh, to test this out. So we're going to be running face-to-face -face workshops. You can see the dates, 22nd and the 24th. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of a pre-task, which is just a task that's going to ask you to review your strategies so that we can understand, you know, what you're trying to achieve, what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, then when we start, we'll have a half day on the 22nd where we're going to be understanding how the circular economy can be linked to your current strategies. So that's kind of a strategic focus day. On the 23rd, we're going to focus on, you know, identifying new ideas. So I'm going to give you a number of different lenses to think through. And um, as you can see there, the six topics are essentially the six um, 
somatic areas that I produced earlier here, those six there. On the 24th, um, we'll then convene to begin the process of creating a strategic roadmap. So the goal is for everybody to come away from this program with a series of initiatives that they can either employ right away in their operations, or at least use to springboard a deeper dive into how you can commercially make uh, you know, a splash in the circular economy. Once you leave the, uh, the workshops, um, we're going to have uh, some post-workshop tasks. So you can see the dates here. We're basically asking you to spend some time drafting out your roadmap. And then uh, sometime in early September, we're going to have a peer review process where you will exchange uh, your roadmap with another partner firm. And that partner firm will give you some advice and input in how to improve your business plan. And we're gonna do that two times. So that's why there's a two week period there. And then finally, you'll have some time to finalize the roadmap. And we're gonna do some presentations the first week in, in August. Uh, and of course, give away some wonderful awards for companies that come up with some of the uh, uh, stellar uh, innovations through this program. Uh, I also note just on the left here that we'll also be having at least two virtual teas. So the idea there is that we're going to uh, bring in some speakers um, and uh, our speakers will be people who have uh, had some experience in working in the circular economy. And they're gonna give you some insights in how you can take this roadmap forward. Um, so they'll talk to you about the challenges that they have faced uh, in implementing some of these ideas. So that's it folks, um, I'll circulate the slides later, but as you can see, we've worked with a lot of organizations. Um, everybody's uh, had, had a great time uh, and learned a lot, I hope, through this program. We've certainly had some really positive feedback from organizations that have been involved and we hope to uh, continue the journey with many of you this August. And I shall leave it at that. Thanks Angela, back to you. Thank you, Paul, for the information about the um, Circular Advantage Program. Um, next, we have Paul Hughes um, from Integra Systems. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, th thanks, Angela. And uh, thanks, Scott. Um, I, I must admit, it was uh, like a real uh, a brief refresher of the whole Circular Advantage Program. Um, so yeah, we we undertook the program last year. Just just hang on a sec. I'll just share my screen. Um, hopefully, can everyone see the the screen I'm sharing there? I can't um, can't see it myself. Yeah, we can see it fine. Well, Thanks, that's, Paul. That's great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, as I as I mentioned, um, we undertook the the circular advantage program last year, and as an outcome of that, we we actually won one of the category awards. But that's not uh, really what I wanted to talk about. So we we're, we're a um, design and manufacturing uh, base, uh, design and manufacturing company in uh, located in Broadmeadows. So we've always um, had a real focus on, on product design and design for manufacture. But I, I felt that, um, you know, we really needed to understand a whole lot more about um, circularity because, um, you know, quite often in our design, um, we're thinking more about the product design and less about the, the process design. And we really feel that there's, you know, we could see that there was a lot of, um, low hanging fruit in terms of well the kaizen of, of uh, processes. So, so essentially, um, look, there's too many uh, outcomes that we achieve from the, the circular advantage program to sort of get through it all in in uh, five minutes. But essentially, for us, it was really about embarking on a on a cultural change so that a circularity could really be embedded in in all parts of our business. So. So we put three people through the through the program. Myself as the business owner, um, Nick, our our uh, design manager, and Shri, who is a con continuous improvement person, but largely 
sort of process related to, to things in the factory. So by doing that, we kind of got a, a I suppose, a broad uh, set of, a set of uh, insights and opinions from the from the course material that we can sort of put together and and um, develop into um, a, a, a blueprint if you like or a way to to move forward so one of the key outcomes with the program was that we developed a um, circular design blueprint that we um, that we refer to the the whole design team so we've got a design team con consisting of industrial designers, mechanical engineers, um, product design engineers. So we've got quite a, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm skipping, uh, I should skip to the next slide, but yeah, um, a multidisciplinary um, design team. And we, yeah, so we, we essentially wanted to kind of embed this circular thinking it throughout the whole design team. And whilst we were focused on design for manufacture and, and there was a lot of circular principles in what we did we weren't really you know we we're only sort of uh touching the surface and we also having um a really well we've got a multi-skilled um team and a really young uh quite a young design team the 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 effect on the culture you know kind of the circularity and the and the thinking that goes behind it really gave our people a purpose and sort of really you know young people are sort of well and and old people like myself are quite environmentally conscious and it sort of made us realize that as design as product and pro well, with the ability to design out to design our products and processes we could really make some some change in terms of um, circularity we just had to be be aware of it and you look, look we've got a you know apart from a young team, we've got a really positive can-do team sort of right through the whole organisation. Um, so that's, I suppose, I've, I've focused a bit on the um, design side of it. And um, so our, our um, circular uh, blueprint looks like this. We, we don't need to go through it in, in detail, but it really highlights the things that we want our design team looking looking at, you know, when we design something and it might be something, you know, it's not necessarily about how it's designed or how it's made or how it's going to be repurposed or kept in operation. It can even be, like I was speaking to Scott offline, like it can even be to do with our business model around, around what we're doing with a, with a particular product. Um, so that's on the, uh, I suppose, starting on the design side of it, but then on the process side of it, we've developed a kiosk-based um, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing execution system to really streamline our processes through and, and digitise our whole manufacturing environment. And um, we've really pushed together, uh, pushed forward on that and probably approached certain things in that a different way um, to what we were prior to doing the program, but having um, pushed ahead a lot in, in that area, we've um, actually realised how much we can help other manufacturers with, with this product and help them become sort of more streamlined, which is ultimately going to reduce waste, um, in, well, waste in time and, and, and processing and um, in terms of mistakes. And... Um, so we've actually kind of carved that off as a as a product of our of our own um, now for, uh, following the program, um, and uh, finally, what one that uh, one thing that uh, George mentioned earlier, and with the support of Hume, and also through this program, and um, Scott also mentioned um, Steve Morris from from Close the Loop. So it was kind of a collaborative thing that we got introduced to a company in Holland who was who's really um, best practice in terms of circularity and the way they manufacture, design and manufacture. Um, they had a system of um, circular wastes, essentially circular waste bins that they were wanting, that they felt was uh, perfect for the Australian market. So we've undertaken an agreement with them. So it's a digital licensing agreement where their designs are transferred to us 
and their and their manufacturing know how is transferred to us uh, digitally and you know collaboratively, and we manufacture their products under license for the for the Australian market, which really you know overall makes real sense for a uh, circularity point of view as well. That you're not shipping um, you know these bulky um, containers all around the world. So there's um, a whole lot of uh, outcomes. Um, you know, on, on many different levels from, from the program. I should have just um, uh, I've mentioned our K4.0 um, kiosk. So that's, that's what, it, what it looks like there. And um, yeah, so we, it, we're really um, trying to have a circularity um, focus and also a digital focus to everything we do moving forward. Because I think di digital, Digitization really ties in with circularity as well in terms of streamlining processes and reducing waste. So yeah, look, I can't uh, recommend the program highly enough. It was highly beneficial from us dealing with, uh, well, speaking with, well, not only Scott, but peers in the industry and hearing their views on, on how they're approaching it, not even related industries, but just how um, others are sort of seeing the circularity and it's really, um, paved the way forward for us in, in the circular economy. So, yeah, thanks for your time. Uh, also, if there's any, any questions, there's uh, my contact details. So thanks, everyone. Paul, do you want to put your contact details in the chat? Uh, yep, I can do that. Yeah, yep, no worries. Um, so thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you, Paul. Copy this into the. I'm not sure if I can just copy everything to the chat. Thank you, Paul, for that information. Um, this in. Now, Sophie, um, are you ready to present? Um, yeah, I think George was actually going to kick us off for this section. Okay, yeah. Go right ahead, George. Can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, we can Fantastic. see Fantastic. So uh, thanks once again for attending today's session. And one of the key things about today is building this community of circular champions. And you would have seen this slide um, earlier on, and, and we'd love to see you become part of that, not just in Hume, but across Melbourne's north. Um, so the, what is the investment for this program? Well, he, here's the figures in front of you. Uh, that's the investment. I would like to draw attention to um, a $500 subsidy, which is essentially a payment returned to you, the business that completes this program once you've successfully delivered your CE, um, your circular economy roadmap. So if you like, that's a kind of uh, in incentive for you to complete um, the program. You, you can see the timelines uh, listed there. Notably is a three-day workshop at the Craigieburn um, uh, Global Learning Centre in, in Craigieburn Town Centre. Um, and, and that's where you will really get into the meat um, or the veg, depending on your, um, uh, um, your approach to food um, of the program. And um, we, we think that this is a program which is <laughs> really gaining in traction um, you heard from Paul, you saw the other businesses that have participated. Um, if you talk to them, you'll find that they'll all say that this is something that is just fundamentally important to the future of business. Um, there's a, um, a link there for registration, which you can also uh, all see. So um, I, I hope you feel well motivated now to, to register. And I'll, I'll pass to Sophie Hollingsworth from KPMG, just to close out on the process before we go into a Q&A session. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, George. And can you just flick to the next slide for me? Perfect. 
Excellent. So everybody in the lead up, I'm conscious that Scott's walked you through um, what will be um, undertaken during that three day workshop. Um, and man, we're all over the place with the slides here, but essentially in the lead up to August 24th, um, we've got the the registration will be opening today, um, so you can, can get in early if you are keen. We've got a second information session coming up on July 7th for if there's anyone else in your networks that is might be interested in this or others within your respective companies or governments. Um, we'd love to have them join us for a second information session. Um, then KPMG will be sending out a participant agreement letter for anyone that has um, signed up and expresses their interest. And then the lovely team at Hume will be issuing some invoices um, through the periods that are denoted on the slide. Um, you'll get your welcome pack mid-August, and then we will kick off that three-day workshop um, August 22nd to August 24th. So I would love to, I guess, now kick off um, the question session um, that I think Scott will probably lead, but um, I'm open to any questions that you guys have. So if anyone would like to um, ask any questions, if you'd like to click in the Q&A. You can go right ahead now. While we're waiting for the barrage of questions, if I can just sort of highlight um, a bit of what Paul's talked about uh, as I said in the chat, we really didn't have enough time to sort of um, fully highlight just what um, type of journey he has been leading his troops on. Um, you know, I've, I've probably done work with close to 100 companies in the CE now, and, and I get a really good sense of, you know, where companies are going to wind up um, just by looking at leadership. You know, in, in Paul's case, um, he came into the program not just with an open mind personally, but with an intent to ensure that uh, they approach the program as a as a team. And so, you know, he brought two other colleagues and uh, two two design colleagues. And this, I think, is something that's worth highlighting uh, if you are considering joining the program. Um, really, it's better to have a, a couple of people on the program. Uh, if you can do so, because it sparks thinking. It uh, creates that ethos that goes beyond just the one person who's taken the program, and it creates a little bit of momentum. Um, Paul, would you like to maybe talk a little bit about that? Because that was, to me, quite remarkable how you managed that process. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I was at, in actual fact, I was just typing into the, into the chat, but... Um, like it was like one of the the ones um, the exercise with the the different hats you know through through the course and that you know and everybody thinks differently and I reckon if you've got people um, you know with a I mean I suppose we've all got a, a design focus but we're all coming from from different angles so if you've got a, a, a cross section of of your people it, it's far easier to make it a, a cultural change across um, all levels because it, you know, I, I suppose, you know, people think that, you know, their, their opinion's pre pretty important, but when you, when you hear sort of how other people um, see things, it sort of makes you really, um, or it challenges your own thinking. So it was, I, I you know, can't, uh, again, can't stress how important it is to have sort of a couple more than one person from your organization um yeah that that's a critical thing because it really is a, a cultural thing and I, I think um you know from a cultural point of view once you if you start talking the language then it sort of start uh, things start to happen you know and even the way we're talking to customers then we're sort of starting to hear things you know hear the same sort of language repeated back from from our customers and I think that's when where real change can happen and you know recently we exhibited at Oztec in um, Sydney and we were sort of um, you know reinforcing that that whole thinking so I think you know people sort of starting to talk the same way and think think the same way you know ends up making a change and 
you know, sort of one thing within your organisation, but then getting it out to your customers and that as well really starts to create change. Yep. Hopefully uh, that sort of covers it a bit, Scott. Scott, we have, um, we've got a question here from Philippa. Hi, Philippa. Um, she's asking if uh, we have businesses in Hume, but also some outside of Hume, can they participate as part of our business sign up? That is, can we include people from our facilities outside Hume as well as those in Hume? Great, thanks. Well, uh, Philip, I, I guess my initial reaction is why, why would anybody want to locate anywhere outside of Hume? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, good, good question, and it's something that we should have covered. So thanks for uh, touching up upon this. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, I, I'm not sure, George, I, I suspect that in terms of subsidies, it would be hard to provide a subsidy to uh, organizations outside of Hume. So you won't get the $500 kickback um, but, um, you know, of course, the more the merrier, because, you know, part of Hume's circular city project, um, it's not just Hume, it's, it's the north, it's beyond the north, we're, we're trying to create a, you know, a solid, you know, network of like minded businesses that can all profit together. That's spot on, Scott, it's too important a subject for us to uh, simply lock down on, on Hume. Um, so yes, uh, businesses from outside of Hume can participate. And um, if you're a Hume business and you've got other people from uh, linked businesses coming in from outside of Hume, that is absolutely uh, that is absolutely fine. Um, I um, uh, encourage. We've actually encouraged businesses across Melbourne's north uh, through the councils in the north to participate. Uh, I mean, this is a huge movement and we're fortunate to be perhaps a little bit ahead of some other councils with what we're, uh, what we're doing. Very happy to, uh, to share. Um, in, in terms of the subsidy, uh, look, that's a really interesting observation. Um, we'll probably have to have a, a, a bit more of a detailed conversation with us directly as you're in the process of registering. Um, in terms of working out um, whether you get the, the the subsidy just the once for the Hume business, or you know multiple times for other businesses that uh, that register from outside of Hume. Is there any other questions anyone would like to ask? Either Paul, or George, Sophie, Scott. Oh, we do have another one. And this is from here. As part of the program, do participants measure their carbon footprint to set a baseline and link the roadmap to achieve net zero emissions? You, you can do, you can do. Um, so what, you're in, what, what you decide to focus on within the program is entirely up to you. Um, you know, my, my focus is on helping you to identify when it comes to energy, energy efficiency uh, opportunities or, you know, opportunities to shift into uh, renewables. Um, but, you know, in terms of what you're actually aiming to achieve, so setting that final goal, um, it would be wonderful to see an organization that steps forward and says, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to emphasize um, greenhouse gas emission reductions and here's how we're going to do so. Okay, we have another one from Ian Johnson. Being a past participant in the program, would Eagle Lighting be eligible for the $500 rebate if we register additional staff in this program round? Yeah, I think the, if you register again for this program, then you're entitled to that, uh, that refund, yeah. Right. I was also going to, I was just going to mention one other thing too. So it's, you know, like the types of businesses, you know, like probably a lot of people sort of think where can it fit into your business, but even um, like we have quite a bit to do with the defence industry and even industries as kind of, as perceived as kind of 
quite hard nosed and harsh and uh, as defence are really looking at how they can improve, you know, their their overall business. You know, particularly there's there's um, one large defence company who's um, going to be setting up down um, in Geelong or, or near near Geelong, and they got a greenfield site so they're looking at how they can sort of really streamline things and be as um, circular as possible so I know there's probably a lot of people who are looking at becoming suppliers or who are currently suppliers to defence but um, it's a real um, focus if you can kind of offer that circularity um, thinking to the defence industry as well. Yeah, it, it really is the modern way of doing business and uh, the momentum is uh, is extraordinary. Yeah, definitely. Just it's to kind not- of expand on that, just uh, very briefly too, Paul, you know, Paul's comment, um, you know, I think underlies, you know, the, the group that's gone through the programs as well. You know, we've had, uh, we, we had council members uh, taking the program and looking at circular economy strategies for councils. We have had um, members, uh, Salvation Army last year won, a, won an award for um, their work in the program. Uh, Julia McKay's group at Enable, which is a social venture in Hume. Uh, so, you know, we've had, we've had a very broad array of organizations. And that to me is, and Paul touched upon this earlier, that's that's actually one of the allures of the program is that you're not in a room full of people uh, who have a like-minded view of their industry sector. So they're able to see things from a a fresher perspective. I've got one last question before we uh, finish up. Uh, Hugh O'Donnell, is there a limit on the number of participating companies? Who would like to answer that one? I, I mean, if I can just say, I think we need to cap it at at least a thousand. We we certainly shouldn't go over that, George, if you don't mind. <laughs> well, look, that would be a dream uh, to have that many companies participating. Look, I, I think uh, the way we've got it structured at the, the moment, uh, we can effectively handle up to about 40 participants. Scott, would, would that yeah. be reasonably accurate? Yeah. Um, and uh, so we'd be delighted if we hit that number. We've had we've had in the twenties uh, in the past couple of years. Um, if we can push towards forty this year, that would be outstanding. Um, and uh, as both Scott and Paul have said, you know, uh, to depending on the size of your business, uh, I, I suspect, but having two or three participants from a business is uh, potentially a huge but huge bonus. Uh, into how those people act as champions in implementing their circular roadmap within their business. The other thing that we didn't talk about, George, which we probably should have mentioned, was that this is also part of a broader journey that Hume is on. And so that means that after this program, um, all of the companies that have gone through this program will join the alumnus of of previous uh, versions of this and will be playing a key role in helping Hume to map out uh, a circular economy network uh, to underpin the Hume's circular city strategy. So this is, you know, there's benefits, not just, you know, through the program and an introspection on what you're doing now, but in terms of identifying new opportunities with firms within the broader remit of what Hume is trying to achieve. Yeah, great point, Scott. Uh, You know, we will be having, um, seminars and webinars and sessions uh, in the years moving ahead and uh, you know um, uh, alumni businesses will be able to participate in that network with each other and uh, continue to learn and share and i hear we're going to have blueberry muffins at the workshops if i'm not mistaken there we go george do you want to um finish up for today Thanks, Angela. Look, I, I, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank uh, everybody for participating. Uh, great that you've come along and heard, and I hope it has resonated with you. We really do believe that this is an extraordinary opportunity for, for businesses of all shapes and sizes. Um, I'd like to thank the panellists for today um, who've joined us from um, Kyushu 
and uh, Sydney and uh, a couple of us from uh, little old Broadmeadows. Um, it's um, been a great pleasure to work with this group of people on the journey that the city has been on and will continue on for, for many years to come. So uh, all the very best to all of you and, uh, and, and be safe and hopefully we'll see you uh, registering and attending session one. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.